I am so excited to introduce you to the savvy, resourceful plant ladies that are joining us on the podcast today for the most amazing conversation about a highly popular topic these days, homesteading. But homesteading on social media can look really different from what homesteading could be in our homes and gardens. So what is homesteading, you might ask? The homesteading that we see on social media looks like it takes so much work, is so inaccessible. You've got to live off grid. You've got to be in an eco hut on acres and acres of land, growing your own food and never leaving your property. No, that is not homesteading, plant friends. These women are homesteading, growing food, raising chickens, composting, harvesting maple syrup on less than an acre in the suburbs of Minnesota. They are making homesteading accessible in a way that I have not seen before, and I am so excited to invite you into this incredible conversation that will leave you so inspired and looking at your small lawns and backyards like you never have before. Welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, the Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Hello, plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. If you are new here, welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. I'm your host, Maria, and I am here to help you live a happier life by connecting to nature, whether it's with houseplants or gardens or just getting outside in your local parks or forest. I'm here to help you connect with nature to connect with yourselves. And if you're an old plant friend here, welcome back. I hope your gardens are growing so good. Ours is in full swing, the grow bag garden. I have about 20 grow bags growing right now. It's felt so good to have my hands in the dirt after such a long winter. I live in the Catskills. It was literally 40 degrees in like mid-June here. (laughs) But we're in the full swing of summer days, long summer days, which means breathe deeply, enjoy the blooms that you have in your garden right now get outside, eat ice cream. The other day, my husband looked at me and he was like, should we go for ice cream? It was after dinner. And I was like, ice cream? And he said, yeah, it's the summertime. We eat ice cream in the summer. And I was like, I totally forgot. I got to reframe getting the summer mindset. Speaking of mindset, your mindsets are going to be changed after you listen to this episode today. I am so inspired by our guests, Stephanie and Michelle plant friends, and co-authors of the book Small Scale Homesteading, a sustainable guide to gardening, keeping chickens, maple sugaring, preserving the harvest, and more. They are about to unload such immense insight into how they took the next step from just being gardeners to being homesteaders. They will inspire us to look at our gardens more holistically and see how we can root into this practice of gardening and caring for the planet and caring for the earth and caring for our families even more. In a very small scale way, both of these ladies live on smaller than an acre of land and the work that they're doing and the produce and the yield that they're getting from their homesteads is absolutely incredible. Surprisingly, and I have to say, you know, this conversation is so insightful. You're going to learn so much and you're going to be so like turned on to go dive even deeper to the topics that we talked about today. But what really touched me the most about this conversation was number one, the accessibility. These women are making homesteading a seemingly intimidating lifestyle on social media feel so accessible and so doable. I haven't stopped thinking about them since I did this interview with them a month ago. But also, they're plant friends. They're plant friends that met and cultivated their friendship and got to the point where they wrote a book together. I'm going to let them share how they wrote this book together, but it's so sweet. I mean, plant friends are the best friends. And these women are just lovely. They're just lovely people. I'm so excited that they reached out to me and that I got to read their book and that, you know, we're having them and highlighting the amazing work they're doing. Speaking of plant friendship, I need to welcome some new plant friends who just joined our Garden Society app and platform. Karen Deep, Sherry, and Arlene, welcome to the Growing Joy Garden Society. If you don't know what the Garden Society is, it's my Android and iOS app and platform that you can access via a computer. And it's what I like to call the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. It's where our group of international listeners can come together digitally to swap stories 
the three like themes of the platform is to make new plant friends, propagate your knowledge and grow more joy in your life. So if you're looking to make plant friends like these beautiful plant friends that we're going to hear from today, join the Garden Society. It's like the price of a coffee a month, well, a fancy coffee, but it's like the price of a fancy coffee a month. And you get access to this incredible platform, but by also participating in the community, you're supporting the podcast and you're supporting the business that creates this content for you on a monthly basis. And it's greatly appreciated. We've shut down our Patreon and now our listeners support us through joining this community. So if you're interested, you can go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan and I'll see you in there. All right. This was a long, deep conversation. I'm so excited to share it with you. I know I've said this several times, but I really have not stopped thinking about these women since this conversation. I have had multiple conversations with Billy about getting chickens. I had a conversation with my landlord about if I could have chickens in our rental property we have right now. We're thinking about how we're going to preserve our harvest. Like there are so many small actionable steps that Billy and I are personally taking after me being so inspired by this conversation. And I hope it inspires you as much as it inspired me. So without further ado, Here's Stephanie and Michelle. Stephanie and Michelle, welcome to Growing Joy. I am so excited to finally have a conversation about something I'm very curious about, homesteading. Woohoo! <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yeah. Okay. I have so many questions for you that I want to dive in. But before that, I think the best way to just kind of showcase what is homesteading is asking both of you to share a short encapsulation of your homesteading journey. So Stephanie, do you want to start and just kind of introduce yourself and tell us how you became the homesteader you are today? Sure. Well, I'm Stephanie Thoreau. I'm author of Three Food Preservation Cookbooks and co-author of Small Scale Homesteading, which Michelle and I wrote together. I'm a master food preserver and master gardener, and I teach classes locally about food preservation. My journey started just on a whim, really. I just wanted to learn how to make pickles. And so I found someone to teach me and we canned pickles and beets and jam. And I was just totally obsessed after that. And so then, yeah, I just started making all the jams and all the different things I could do. And then we purchased our first house and it had a garden. So we planted it out. Pretty much everything was dead you know, midsummer. <laughs> and then, but we kept trying every year and it just grew from there. So we had to expand on the gardens and expand on the things that we did. And it just grew naturally. It wasn't like a, a decision. It was just more and more interests. And so the, now we have, you know, gardens in the front yard and in the backyard and we have chickens now. I mean, a big part of that was the 2020 being stuck at home, having more time to like, that's when I got my chickens, but we just, we didn't have the time before because it is a lot of work, but it, it was a great way to keep your mind busy during that time. And so we also had a big tree taken out that year and we were able to expand on the garden in a major way in the backyard. So, so yeah, just kind of happened over the years, over the last 18 years, I guess, in total to get to the point where I am now. It wasn't, it wasn't something that I decided and did quickly. And what does your homestead setup look like now? What's the fully built out homestead? Well, okay. So Michelle and I both live in the suburbs of Minneapolis and I'm in the first ring. So our neighborhood is is like a post-World War II neighborhood. Ramblers, our homes are close together. I don't have much yard space, but in my front yard, I have six gardens and I grow flowers and vegetables and we're expanding on that again this year. And then I have you know, the borders of my yard, I have gardens and behind my garage, I have a big garden. And then in the corner of my yard, I have a small chicken coop. I can only have three chickens here where I live. So we grow a lot of food, but I, I definitely don't grow enough to, you know, sustain us all year. We go to the farmer's markets and get the cucumbers and tomatoes and stuff like that. So just for my sense, are you on less than an acre of land? Yeah, I'm on less than a quarter acre. I have 0.15 of an acre and that has my home and driveway and garage on it. That is so inspiring. And are your gardens in ground? Some of them are. And some of them are, uh, yeah, I have raised beds and some of them are in the ground, both. That is so cool. So you're truly like foodscaping. I think an aspect of why homesteading is so intimidating to people is they think that they need acres and acres of land to do it. And the fact that you're doing it on 0.15 of an acre is so cool. I love that and speaks to your small space homesteading book. What about you, Michelle? Yeah. So Michelle Brune is my full name. <laughs> Here we go. 
I run Forks in the Dirt, and I've been doing that as a way to kind of connect local food with my local community. And I have been interviewing farmers and talking to people about just local food, and I run farmers markets, and then I teach around the Twin Cities as well, uh, mostly gardening classes. I write for different magazines and stuff. So that's kind of always been a passion of mine. I've always been a garden girl. I grew up with land. I grew up with like a love of nature. I was always a tree hugger. I was like the youngest weirdo, like junior high schooler in the Minnesota Herbalist Guild. (laughs) Like, (laughs) Oh my God, I love that. You were in the Herbalist Guild, like with all the like lady, like with adults. Yeah. All the grandmas loved me. (laughs) Oh my God, that's incredible. And it was thanks to a neighbor who brought me along and knew that I was interested in it. So I was maintaining gardens, which is the fancy way of saying, you know, the weeder (laughs) for my high school and all that. And then I worked at landscape companies and in greenhouses and all kinds of stuff. So I've seen like the industry change a lot. And I'm so excited to see where we're at now with like caring about nature and seeing like the full cycle and the like how we are part of nature and we're not separate from it. You know, Wendell Berry quote there, but it's, I don't know, it's just a beautiful thing to be able to get more people excited about this and know that as we were just talking about, you don't need to move to the 40 acres to live closer to nature and to have a better relationship with it. There's so much you can do. And I'm on 0.4 or something acres in a suburb outside of St. Paul. And we have yeah, gardens in the front yard and the backyard. We both have maple trees that we tap as well, Stephanie and I, and we have got chickens. I love that chapter of your book. Yeah, I can't wait to ask you about it. <laughs> yeah, it's just like nectar from your trees right there. It's amazing. So yeah, so there's a lot that you can do in a really small space. And I think that that's what we're so excited to share. Yeah, so just to clarify, you're also on about a half an acre. You have a chicken coop. How many chickens do you have? I have the allotted number for my area. Yes, I do. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. Great. And then you said you have gardens in the front and the back. Do you also have a combination of in-ground and raised beds? Yeah. So I've got mostly an in-ground bed in the front because we did a huge renovation in the front a couple of years ago. It started just with a pollinator garden and then we sheet mulched a large part of the lawn in the front. And now that's where I have a lot of berry bushes because it's just a beautiful sunny space. So when you talk foodscaping, absolutely 100% love that. And then in the backyard is more of a an, a formal official vegetable garden. Um, and I've got raised beds. I've got an hugel culture bed. I've got in-ground beds. I've got a cold frame, a gr- little mini greenhouse. And then I pop up low tunnels to be able to extend the season a little bit more because we are both Stephanie and I being in Minnesota, we have a relatively short growing season. (laughs) So we want to get as much out of it as possible. Yeah. When's your last frost date? (sighs) Well, it's debatable, but actually today, as we're recording, May 10th is our official last frost date in the Twin Cities. But I'm planting six weeks before that in low tunnels and cold frames to get stuff going. It just depends on what seeds and what plants you want to grow. Yeah. Wow. I love that. Yeah. Ours is even later than yours. And I'm in a freaky microclimate in the Western Catskills of New York where I cannot plant before Memorial Day. Oh, wow. And it's driving me nuts. And I rent, so I can't, I'm a grow bag gardener right now. So I don't have frames or anything, but anywho, enough about me. Okay. You wrote this book, Small Scale Homesteading. I woke up this morning at 630 and read the whole thing. (laughs) I have to say a few things about your book. Number one, As a podcaster, I get sent a lot of books to my husband's annoyance. He's just like, you have too many books. And normally when books arrive, it pisses him (laughs) off, but it doesn't piss him off. Sorry, I don't want to paint him in that light, but he's just like, oh my God, another book. Great. This was the first book that he actually read before I did. He was like, homesteading. That sounds interesting. And I actually caught him one morning just sitting with your book, reading it. And I was like, I haven't even read that yet. Oh, that's so awesome. thank you. Yay. <laughs> and so something I'm so curious about, especially now having gone through the process of writing a book too, I was so inspired and touched by how many other women you lift up in your book. You have moments in your, number one, you're a collaboration, right? There, It's two women who have authored this book, but also you have features of 
different creators who have specialties in herbalism or chicken keeping or this. You're recommending your friends' companies. And the book starts with this testament to community and why homesteading is really about community. So I want to know, how did you guys meet? Was it through your homesteading passion? It was. We met on Instagram, actually. Your Instagram friends. <laughs> and you wrote a freaking book together. That's so amazing. That's just like Houseplant Club. So how did you meet? Well, we must have met like six or seven years ago. And I guess probably through hashtags or something, just finding people that have common interests because none of my friends at the time really did any food preservation. They didn't really do much gardening. And so I loved Instagram for that reason. I was like, oh, these are my people. And and so now we've met many, many different people from the area from Instagram in person. But Michelle runs a winter farmer's market. And she asked if I would teach a fermentation class. And so that's what got us like on the phone and in person for the first time. And that was probably four years ago. And then we were on the phone collaborating about something else. And I had already pitched this idea to my publisher, but then I was sitting on it for months and months and months because I wanted someone to write with me. And when I was on the phone with her, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have this idea. Do you want to write this with me? Because she's such like a gardening wizard and she was like, be perfect for it. And she said, well, let me think about it. That sounds good. You know, let me think about it. So then we talked about it later and we pitched it to my editor and it it is what it is. Okay. I'll clarify. I thought about it for like a hot minute and I was like, heck yeah, I am in. This would be so much fun. And you really can see that you are friends with very complementary skills uh, where, you know, Stephanie's the canner, Michelle's the, the gardener primarily, and you guys really trade off your... The thing I also liked about the book is, so I lived in 500 square feet, moved to five acres in the woods. I'm renting, so I can't do anything with my land right now. But the more I live in the woods, the more I'm like, oh, yeah. I, when we buy a house, I'm going ham. I'm having chickens. I'm doing all of this. And my husband is into baking bread. He's into preserving. My sister jokes that the longer Billy and I stay in the woods, the more like into the 1700s we go. Cause like my hobbies are like embroidery and sewing and his are like (laughs) spoon whittling and baking, you know, but as someone who feels a little intimidated about homesteading, the other thing I liked about your book is you each write it separately. So I get two women's experience of what their homestead looks like. It's not one, this is how you do it. It's this how I did it. Oh, okay. But she did it this way, but I did it this way actually. And, you know, here's some general things that you can do, but you should go do it on your own. What has the role of community played in how you've kind of developed your homesteads? And why did you choose to open your book with almost a chapter on community? We're in the swing of summer, but Territorial Seed Company wants to make sure that you're planning ahead while enjoying your summer harvests, plant friends. As you're harvesting your spring and summer veggies and tomatoes this year, it is the perfect time to start planning what to do with that space and why not extend your harvest by growing a fall and winter garden. Did you even know you can do that? The range of cold tolerant crops spans from delicate greens to hearty root vegetables with flowering types like broccoli and cauliflower in between. These veggies taste extra sweet when they're grown in the fall and winter, and that's because of their exposure to cold. So if you've ever had kale after the first frost of the season, you will notice a remarkable difference in the flavor. Root crops like carrots, beets, radishes, and parsnips can size up and then remain in ground until you're ready to use them. So winter gardening can actually be a really ideal storage spot for those crops. The key to a successful winter garden is to simply plant one and pick the right crops to grow. So while you're enjoying the bounty of your tomatoes, squash, peppers, and melons right now, it's time to get planning. Put in a little effort right now to ensure that you have fresh picked food for your holiday meals and throughout the early months of the new year. And you get a discount when you buy them with Territorial Seed Company. So all you have to do is go to territorialseed.com slash growing joy to shop their incredible selection of crops that are best suited for fall and winter growing. And you'll get a 10% discount on all Territorial Seed items. Once again, that's territorialseed.com slash growing joy to get 10% off of anything you want to enhance your garden season, grow into the fall and winter, get your garlic growing, get your leaves growing, get your Brussels sprouts growing. Once again, 10% off at territorialseed.com slash growing joy. (music) 
Imagine that beautiful harmony wafting its way through your lawn and garden this year. Or better yet, gifting the glorious experience of a Wind River chime to a loved one. So every time they hear it sing, they think of you. Hands down, one of the best things Billy and I ever did for our mindfulness practices in 2023 is hang Wind River chimes on either side of our house. They sing in the wind throughout the day, and every time they do, their melodies are an invitation to stop what we're doing, take a deep breath, and drop back into the present. Not to mention, they just make me smile because they sound so dang pretty. We joke that our house feels like a spa. (laughs) Today, Wind River wants to use their ad time to gift you a mindful moment with their chimes, so please enjoy. Let's take a big breath in, hold it, exhale. Another big breath, hold it, and exhale again. The chimes are so magical, and not only do they sound magical, but the company is magical. The Wind River Chimes is rooted in service. For chimes purchased on windriverchimes.com, they donate 20% of the purchase price to charity each month. 20% to charity. So friends, get yourself or your loved one a chime for your next birthday, your next wedding to celebrate, a memorial, and when you use the code GROWINGJOY at windriverchimes.com, you'll get a free engraving on any engravable wind chime to add a special element to your gift. They come in a variety of colors, sizes, and sounds, so head to windriverchimes.com to listen, and don't forget to use code GROWINGJOY at checkout to receive a free engraving. windriverchimes.com, code GROWINGJOY at checkout. I think community, especially because we're suburban homesteaders, right? We are not going to be able to do it on our own. And that's never been like our goal. I think it's a lot more fun to do things in community in general. We are always going to be dependent on our farmers. So let's get to know our farmers a little bit better. Let's build a relationship with them because then they'll tell you, hey, next week at market, I'm going to be bringing extra this. Do you want in on those (laughs) or whatever, right? So there's that part of the community, but then there's also community with your neighborhood with your larger city, town, whatever, that you can make connections with and maybe share seeds, plants, maple sap for honey. You can swap things. You can swap knowledge. Um, Somebody has a sunny spot. You have a shady yard. There's a million different ways that you can work together with community. And it's, I mean, hands down, so much more fun when you're doing it with other people, with other people in mind, too. I think it's a huge part of it. What do you think, Steph? Yeah, this is a sort of sidebar, but I like living in the city. I grew up in South Minneapolis. And so I like being next to people and I like having the conveniences of the city too. And I used to think I needed acres. I used to dream of that. But now that I've done what I've done here and it takes so much of my time, I really can't imagine having tons of land because it would just be so much. So I've actually over you know the last 15 or so years, lost interest in that idea. And also our children are getting older and so much of what we do is with and for them. And there are just things I wouldn't want to do if when my daughter leaves the house. It's interesting you say that because now that I've lived on five acres for multiple years, three, two or three years now, my husband and I are in that conversation as we start family planning of like, this actually isn't sustainable. Like this has been a fabulous chapter of life where we've just like cocooned in the woods. But I think in our future, we'll probably have less land. And it's very inspiring. Your book was very inspiring to read because I feel like I can take that country sense and bring it to a smaller plot. So when talking about homesteading, I think the question that I want to start with is, in your opinion, what makes homesteading different than gardening? Like what takes a garden to a homestead instead of just being a garden? Well, I would say that homesteading encompasses gardening, but homesteading is like much more than gardening. I don't think it's like a difference. I think it's all part of one great, big, beautiful way to live, I guess. And I think homesteading 
takes a garden and instead of having it be beautiful only, it's maybe beautiful for the pollinators that you want to come and help pollinate the vegetables that you're also growing. It's growing as much as you can that is sustainable for you and your family, which means you got to think about the time involved in it too, not just like the space, how much can I fit in here? And then it's also what you do with that food and not only what you eat yourself, but also how you give back to the soil. Composting on your property is really important. And then maybe if you want to add chickens in there at some point, they're integral, I think, to both of our homesteads with like eating the extra garden scraps and, you know, providing eggs, but also providing a whole lot of input for that amazing compost. (laughs) I love that. What about you, Stephanie? Well, first, I think when people think of homesteaders, they think, oh, I have to be doing this, 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 this and be sustainable or, you know, self-sufficient, I mean. And you don't. You could do any part of that, any one part of that. And I think that makes makes it a homestead. And just overall doing more with whatever space you have. I think that's what makes you a homesteader because people think you do need acres and acres and you can do so much with whatever space you have or don't have. I mean, some people live in apartments without any balconies and we have community gardens around. Um, Or one of the features in our book is Black Radish CSA. They're in South Minneapolis. They have a CSA and they use their neighbor's yards to grow stuff, to provide food for their community, which is amazing. I mean, and they take care of everything. So, you know, it's like, hey, can I put this garden bed here and grow stuff and provide food for you? Sure. I mean, super cool. That's so cool. I love that. I guess maybe for both of you, because I'm trying to think like, how do I go from garden to homestead? So what was your first step from garden to homestead, Michelle? Like, what do you feel like switched you to homesteader? So this is maybe a really weird response to this, but I think when I realized that I had some, a lot of pole beans that I was growing one year and in my regular garden, and I realized, oh, these are too far gone. I can't really use them as beans, but wow, look at that bean looks like a bean seed. (laughs) And I'm able to save that seed and then plant it again. That got me thinking in these cyclical, like with nature seasons. And I think that that kind of flipped a switch for me. And I'd already started composting, but I got much more into composting because we were able to start having chickens in our suburban area. And so I think that the combination of being able to look at food as not only food, but seed for next year's food and being able to like take that on myself, that was super empowering. And then at the same time, being able to then learn how to freeze beans, ferment beans and can beans. Like there's a lot of different ways that you can preserve. And then we figured out what we like the best and kind of moving forward. So I think it was that it's, I mean, we've done like kombucha and ginger bug and sourdough and all the fun, like inner inside things to go along with homesteading. But I think Yeah, I think maybe that's the moment if there is a moment, but it was really gradual. I think in general, it was just a, I loved growing food. So now I have all this food. I better do something with it (laughs) because my Mm. neighbors don't really want any more green beans, (laughs) squash, (laughs) lettuce, like whatever. So I needed to figure out what to do with it. So yeah. So then that led me down to preservation, which is kind of the opposite of Stephanie. So Yeah. Out of curiosity, what's your favorite way to eat your green beans preserved wise? What's your favorite way to save? Yeah. Well, it depends on the season, right? Because in the summer, I want them fresh. And in the fall, I fermented dilly beans are the bomb. They're my absolute favorite. And then like right now we have two cans, two jars left of canned, like pressure canned green beans. You either like it or you don't like it, but it tastes like my childhood (laughs) to me. Mm. I love canned green beans. So it depends on the season. I think that that's the only way Mm. I can answer that. I love that. What about you, Stephanie? What was your first step? Well, so I had been canning for years already, but what really changed to, I guess, the homesteader would be when my daughter was born. And I was like, oh, look at all these chemicals in the food and look at all the toxic chemicals in the cleaning products. And I was just more aware of everything all of a sudden. And so I wanted to 
you know, provide the safest, cleanest, best options for her. And so then I really, really started cooking everything from scratch. You know, we got rid of all the plastic in the house. I switched over to WEC jars, which are my second and third cookbooks are in collaboration with WEC jars. I had been using them for years, but I everything I canned for home that I kept here was in WEC jars. Because that's back when BPA was leaching out of the, the lids, the canning lids and yada, yada. And then, you know, the store-bought candles have carcinogens and other chemicals. So I started making my own candles. Then when my daughter got a little older and could help in the garden, she was super into it. So that was a part of expanding it. And, you know, then she really wanted the chickens. And so, yeah, it just grew. And so I would say the biggest switch for mindset would be family. I love that. That's beautiful. Wow. You both have such beautiful stories. You're so inspiring me. You're like a few years ahead of me. I'm so, I feel like I'm looking into my future. Okay. So your book is a really good high level invitation to Homestead. And I was thinking that maybe we could just touch upon the different aspects that we've mentioned. So gardening, seed saving, composting, chickens. I can't wait to ask you about chickens, but um, I just kind of want to touch on you know, if this episode is kind of an invitation, a high level introduction to homesteading, like what people need to understand, because there's so much that you kind of don't understand. So why don't we start with gardening? Michelle, I know you're the garden guru. What are your like top tips or recommendations for someone who, I mean, the majority of the people here who are listening are probably already gardening or their houseplant parents who are thinking about setting up a garden. So when it comes to homesteading, when it comes to a garden that you're wanting a large yield from, what are your your high level tips for people for thinking about setting up a homestead garden? Well, this is going to sound really boring to start with, but like sun map your space, figure out what how much sun you get in certain spots before you set up a garden anywhere. And for those who don't know, how how do you make a sun map? Yeah, so I mean it's as simple as getting out your phone and setting an hourly like alarm on your phone one day you're going to be around and setting like a chair or something, an object out in the yard where you want your garden or a couple places that you might want to put your garden and see when the sun is hitting that object. Like that's as simple as it is. It really doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. And just write it down. And you're going to know that the sunlight changes throughout the seasons as well. But you need at least six hours, I would say at least eight hours to grow like peppers, tomatoes, some of those things, but you can grow lots of other things with less light. So just know how much light you're getting because you want to have the right plant for the right place. I think that that's just like bottom line. Otherwise you're just going to get yourself frustrated by trying to grow things that won't grow well where you're at. Um, So figure out your location and then have fun doing a little garden design, figure out like what space you want to use and everything. But Figure out how much space and all that, but then grow what you love already. Don't grow like what you saw somebody else grow on Instagram that you thought was cute. Grow what you love and what your family will eat. So there's a lot of different things that grow well in different areas of the country. So I can't say, you know, this is the easiest or this is the the hardest or anything, but really start with what you love and then research like two plants a year, right? I'm going to get really good at growing this first and then I'm going to get really good at growing that if you enjoy it, right? So it's start small, start something that you can scale up if you want or scale it back if you're not happy with it. That's the thing is that you don't have to grow all your food. There are wonderful farmers doing amazing jobs growing organic and natural food really all over this beautiful country of ours. So there's lots of options for getting really good local food. Yeah. How much of your garden that you're growing is seed versus seedling? Like, are you buying transplants or are you starting your whole garden from seed? I pretty much start everything from seed here. That means that I'm starting some things a couple months ago. I start first celery and onions like the end of February indoors, you know, with grow lights. And then you kind of add things on as you go, but you don't need to go crazy like that your first year. Um, If you want to start some seeds indoors, definitely invest in a set of grow lights and some really solid trays that will last you because that one investment then will last you for years of seed starting. You don't want to go cheap because you're not going to get as good results. We don't have to get into like the details of of how to grow because I have tons of seed starting episodes, but I will say I did my first seed starting a couple years ago. I bought 
you know, jumpstart seed starting tray, seed starting light that had the little pulley. I bought some trays. I haven't started seeds since then. And I have used that seed starting light for so many random things, whether it's a resuscitation of a house plant, whether it was keeping all the plants alive that I needed for my wedding that I was taking, but I needed like a little incubation station. Like those seed starting lights have come in so handy. And I'm so happy I did buy good ones because I've been able to reuse them. So that's very interesting. And then one other question about gardening, because I feel like for me, the the thing that's going to put me over the edge from being a gardener to a homesteader is figuring out succession planting. Because I think a lot of beginner gardeners garden for the summer. They garden for their tomatoes and their herbs. And that's me. <laughs> it's me. I'm the problem. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have tips for succession planting? Because I also feel like that is intimidating sometimes for people where it's like you got to really be thinking about the dates and what goes with what and all that kind of stuff? Well, so it can be really intimidating, but you start somewhere and you figure out one succession and then the next year you figure out another piece to the puzzle and, or you spend a winter reading all the things and like lay out a whole plant. I am not that person. I like need to like physically experience it and see how it grows together in the garden for me to like make it happen. So I always suggest or, you know, invite people to just take it slow. And remember one season will grow on the next, right? You're always learning. You're always adding. And that's what I think I love about gardening is that there's always more to learn. Try to get back to this, like, what would you suggest for succession planting? Some tips would be look at how many days to maturity a plant is. And we've got from May 10th to like maybe October 1st is our growing window here. So think about how many days to maturity a seed says it's going to take and then figure out if you can start some trays or some pots inside with those seed starting trays, those lights, get them started ahead of schedule so that you can then put in a plant rather than a seed after you harvest that lettuce that's going to bolt right in by, you know, the end of June. So put in something that you've already started like broccoli or cauliflower that you started three, four weeks earlier inside so that you're putting in a plant rather than a seed into that. Unless you want to start carrots, which you would start from seed. There's definitely some nuances to it, but it's really about days to maturity and figuring out your first and last frost dates and how much you can squeeze in there. And then if you want to go beyond that, You can definitely play with some low tunnels, which is really just putting some plastic up over a garden bed, which is why I really love playing with my raised garden beds. I think that they do really well with putting an arched piece of PVC conduit and then putting some plastic over it. So you can move those around for crop rotation. It's really easy to follow your different spaces with that. And you're able to get at least a month extra on each end. So the shoulder seasons, we call that you're able to grow and get a lot more. So we can stretch instead of two successions, we can get three successions even in Minnesota. Because those low tunnels are making it a little bit warmer, protecting from a final freeze. Correct. And extending that fall period as well. Yep. And then in the spring, if you get that up over, it can help melt the snow off of the garden bed. It can help warm the soil up a lot sooner. So I'm able to direct. So like peas, radishes, carrots, things that need, you know, that 40 degree soil temperature to get growing and germinate in the soil. That soil temperature is going to get there weeks ahead of time if it's covered. Wow. If it's covered in just a low, and it's just a low tunnel, there's no other heaters involved. No, no. It's just the sun's power on the plastic. It's really cool. Love it. So cool. Yeah, it's a fun way to play. (laughs) Stephanie, I know that Michelle's the garden guru, but do you have anything? Are there any differences in your approach to your garden than what Michelle's outlined? Yeah, I'm more of like a poke it in, see what happens. Ooh, that worked out. (laughs) Like she's very much like more methodical about it. And, um, but no, she's awesome. I don't really do the season extension or low tunnels yet. Do you do from seed or do you do transplants? Both. Normally, I do quite a lot from seed. This year, I was traveling, so I didn't. And then when I finally did, my whole greenhouse blew over. So I have like sunflowers and yeah, just very few things right now. So thankful for the farmers and the nurseries. I'll be relying on them heavily this year. 
but there's still a lot I can direct so or have already. And they're growing because it got warm finally here. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's warm 50 degrees for you because it's still like 50, 40, 40s and 50s for me. Oh, normally, but it's like been 70s and 80s. So, so nice. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm in your boat, Stephanie. My greenhouse didn't blow over, but I am going to Florida for this month because of my sister's wedding. And because of that, I couldn't start any seeds. So I'm doing all transplants this year where I've I've loved sowing seeds before, but I've also just kind of like released into it. And, you know, I'm working with great companies that are organically growing my transplants and delivering them to my door. So life could be worse. Right. Yeah. It's like, why add the pressure? Like, I feel like I, I've let myself down, but it's like, you know what? It's okay grow them next year. Yeah. Yeah, totally. You can save the seeds, right? (laughs) So actually, and that brings me to the next question. So seed saving, you mentioned, Michelle, your, your aha moment about that bean. How much of your garden is seeds you've saved and then started again? Is that a considerable amount of your garden? A lot of the flowers now definitely are from saved seeds. And then, you know, the beans, the corn, some leeks that are kind of overwintering and now scarlet kale too. But so we're very north. We're zone 4B in Minnesota here. And Maria, what zone are you in? I'm super curious. Do you know what growing zone? I think I'm a zone 5 something, but my microclimate that I'm in, I think probably puts me more in your zone. In 4, okay. Like all the local garden ladies are like, do not plant before Memorial Day because apparently there have been crazy frosts. I mean, it hailed last week here. Yeah. Yeah. So I would assume we're we're probably very similar. Okay. So we can't overwinter many of the brassicas or coal crops. So that's all the cabbages, broccoli, cauliflower, kale. Most of those don't overwinter. So all of those seeds require a biennial, two years of growing in order to produce viable seed to save. So any of those seeds I'm purchasing from like High Mowing Organic or Johnny's Territorial, all those seed companies. The Territorial Seed Company sponsors this podcast. They're amazing. Oh, way to go, Territorial. (laughs) Way to go to Territorial. They're who I ordered my transplants from. Oh, cool. (laughs) Oh, you're going to have so much fun. Yeah, Yeah. they're amazing. So a lot of like the brassicas or those cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, those things I always purchase because I can't grow good seed from that. And then I will throw out there too, a lot of the cucumbers or gourds, pumpkins, melons, those cross pollinate really easily in a garden. So unless you're growing one variety and only one variety, you're likely going to have cross pollination for any open pollinated seeds that you would be able to save. So it makes a lot of sense if you know that you specifically want this kind of cucumber and not some monster cucumber, like weird Frankenstein cucumber to go ahead and purchase those as well, because you can get some really funky things growing. And then really quickly, I said F1, that's a hybrid. So hybrid are things where a seed company has said, we want this trait from this plant and this trait from that plant, like pest resistance in this color, and then they combine those. It's definitely not GMO at all. That's a completely different thing. So hybrids are great. They have more disease resistance and all this other stuff. Open pollinated seeds are what most home gardeners, that's what we can save. So open pollinated heirloom seeds, those are going to be easy to save. They're really going to be come true to type again the next year. So that's what you want to be looking for if you're purchasing seeds with the intent to save, you want to see that they say open pollinated or heirloom. Amazing. Thank you for that clarification. That's super helpful. What would be the easiest seeds that you're saving? You mentioned flowers. Yeah. Well, calendula are great. Marigold are really easy to save. Nasturtium are really easy to save. Poppies, cornflower. I'm like, what can I see on my shelf? I mean, I save a lot of flower Mm -hmm. seeds and they're so wonderful because when you think about it at a nursery, a little four pack of something. I mean, that's a lot. If you have this much garden space that you want to plant out in the years to come, like you're growing and growing more and more, that gets kind of unsustainable. Expensive. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Super expensive. So if you're able to grow those yourself and then save them yourself too, then it's just a cost savings. That's why I love growing from seed in general. And then vegetable seeds that are really easy. I mean, beans are the absolute easiest thing to save. It's my epiphany of like being able to save bean seeds that have gone too far. So you want to let beans and peas dry on the vine 
and like wait until the very end of the season to take them down. So once they're crispy and dry and you can like shake it and hear the seed pod rolling around inside, then you're good to go for saving those. That's the easiest thing to start with saving. I love it. I think going from saving, preserving is a perfect segue. Stephanie, I'm so curious about preserving. I've seen water bath. I've seen the mason jars. We've got the mason jars, but I've heard that there's definitely a canning can be dangerous if you don't do it correctly. So what would be your high level like tips and what are the different ways that people can preserve their grown food? Okay. Well, let's start with the different ways. So I think the easiest way is probably just freezing. Most people have freezers in America. It holds the nutrition really well and it's simple. So that's probably the easiest. And then next would maybe be food dehydration because like, especially for herbs, you can just hang them up. Food dehydrators are low cost to run if you do have to purchase one, but I often see them at garage sales or thrift shops or whatever. And then I would say fermentation is the next easiest method of uh, food preservation because oftentimes it's like if we're fermenting beans, let's do Michelle's green beans. <laughs> you're just making a saltwater brine and you're submerging the beans in that and keeping them submerged for a period of time, like seven days. Um, you could throw in some garlic or hot peppers or whatever, but that's it. That's really it. And to make like sauerkraut, you're just adding salt to shreds of cabbage and mashing it up or massaging. You're not really mashing it unless you like it really soggy. But then again, keeping it in a jar submerged for weeks and then, but that's it. It's just salt in the cabbage. So that's easy once you get over the fear of it. And then I would say water bath canning is next, which is like your jams and your pickles. It's food that you are acidifying or that is acidic enough to be canned safely. That's kind of the gateway to canning. Because then pressure canning is what everyone's really afraid of because you can get very sick if you're not doing it right. And that's where you can do like green beans in water. So no, I think the easiest thing. So the difference between fermentation and pickling is that fermentation doesn't have heat and a pickle, you have to heat it up before you cool it. Well, I think both of them could be under the name of pickle, but there's a vinegar pickle that you will heat up and can. And then there's the saltwater brine fermented pickle. So no heat is applied to fermentation because it would kill off the good bacteria that you're creating through the process of fermentation. Yeah, I'm working with a holistic nutritionist right now and she has me eating fermented foods every day. I eat sauerkraut and kombucha every day for you. Oh, good. It's good. so good for your gut health. Why are we not all doing that? And I buy the fancy sauerkraut. So I'm thinking maybe I should be making my own sauerkraut now that you're talking about it. I think you should because it's definitely more cost effective. You're just you're just buying your organic cabbage or growing it, but they take so long to grow. Yeah, not it's worth so it. Much space. Not worth the investment <laughs> of time. Yeah. I'm like, yay, I grew this. Now what? And I submerged it in water. And so yeah, it would only cost about three dollars for you to make like a quart and a half or two quarts of sauerkraut. And then you can get creative and add in like, you know, garlic or shredded carrots or onions or whatever you want. I mean, there are so many krauts. I've never, ever made a kraut I didn't like. And I've tried, I've experimented with, yeah, tons. So you're literally just dicing up the cabbage, putting it in a mason jar and then putting salt in there. Okay. So I shred it up first. Then you add the salt and you massage the salt into mm -hmm. it until you can squeeze out a handful of liquid. Okay. That's the brine that you're going to submerge it in. So then you transfer it to your clean mason jar. I mean, there's a little bit more that goes into it, but that is really the gist of it. It is that simple. I love that. Okay. And then the water bath canning, how does that work? So like if we're going to make a jam, you can make a strawberry jam. You will take fresh or frozen strawberries, mix it with salt, maybe a little lemon juice. You can get creative and, and put, um, you know, vanilla or something else in there. Following safe recipes. Don't just find them online. Stephanie, Stephanie, you said salt, but you meant sugar. Oh, did I? Yeah, you did say salt, but I was going with it because I like sweet and salty. So I was like, this sounds like a really good jam. <laughs> I got, yeah. Okay, yeah. Sugar. It's sugar. Now people use pectin. None of my recipes have added pectin except I think maybe one, but you don't need to use pectin in everything. You just have to cook it a little bit longer to get it to thicken. That's how they would have done it before they had commercial pectin. So anyway, so then you're, you know, cooking it till it's thickened. And then you're filling your clean, warm jars 
and adding on your clean lids, screwing on the, the rings and submerging them in your hot water bath. And then you'll boil it per whatever the recipe says. So strawberry jam would be 10 minutes. Then you take it out of your canner and put it on your counter till it's completely cooled. So usually until overnight. And then um, the next day you'll take the rings off and test the seal. You won't be able to just lift it off. And at that point, you can have your food on your pantry shelf for 18 months to two years. And it tastes just as good as it the day you canned it. So heating it up and then cooling it creates a heat, a vacuum seal. Exactly. And then once it's all the way cool, it's shelf stable. It doesn't need to be put in the fridge anymore. Right. Not until you um, break that seal. Mm-hmm. Ah, dang. Yeah. My, my mom talks about my grandparents are Italian, were Italian immigrants and they grew. They actually had two plots in Queens, New York. They had a plot for their house and a plot for their garden right next to it. And my grandma and grandpa had the most amazing garden. She smuggled seeds in from Italy. She would grow her heirlooms there. And um, my mom talks about how her and her cousins would get together and do an epic tomato canning situation at the end of the summer. So is that a water bath canning? Back then they probably would have, but um, now you have to add... um lemon juice to it. So yeah, you can still water bath canned tomatoes. You have to acidify them because the acidity isn't acid acidity. <laughs> <laughs> it's not reliable anymore. So you would add lemon juice or citric acid. But yeah, it would depend on how she's preserving them. Mm. But most likely, yeah, water bath canned. I love it. And obviously if people want to learn, we can't cover exactly how to's, but you have three books about canning that we will link in the show notes if people are interested in learning more. So, okay, I need to be mindful of time. And the real reason why I wanted to have you ladies on the show is to talk about chickens. Chickens are on my vision board. I want chickens so bad. I have a baby bird. I have a baby parakeet. I'm obsessed with him. I'm obsessed with birds. What do we need to know? And I think a lot of people are chicken curious. I think a lot of people who have gardens I live in the Catskills. There's a wild tick infestation because we have too many deer. And the best way to manage ticks, everyone says up here, is to have chickens because the chickens eat the ticks. So for someone who like wants chickens but doesn't know what it takes to have them, what are the things that I need to know before going to Tractor Supply Company and getting them? Because for my birthday, my husband literally took me to Tractor Supply Company just so I could look at the chicks. Like the, I love their little peeps. I love their little peeps. They're so cute. Okay, so what do I need to know? What do you need to know? Yeah, they grow quickly. They're only cute and peepy like that for (laughs) a few days. (laughs) Oh, my God. They poop a lot. They poop constantly, and it stinks. We're getting this to be real. Yeah, we don't sugarcoat anything. That's for sure. Yes, please be real. Yeah, I think... There's a lot of different ways to look at it. You can start small again. Like that's my mantra, I think right now. Start small, have fun with it, right? But make sure that your city or town allows it to begin with because there's different city ordinances all across this country. So make sure that your city ordinance allows it. And if it doesn't allow it, go ahead and change it. That's doable. City councils listen to you. And especially with how much more, it's becoming so much more prevalent to be able to have chickens. City councils are definitely listening to that. So make sure you're clear. If you're in the North, you're going to need to have something that's very well protected because it gets, you know, negative 20 where we are, negative 30 sometimes. So we need to have them protected, keep them safe from predators. So a solid chicken coop, you're going to need to have something like that. And then a covered or enclosed kind of run area where they're in the air, but it's just like a wire cage kind of area out from the chicken coop for them are the basics, I would say. What else do you think, Seth? I mean, they constantly need clean food and water or clean water and fresh food. I mean, every day you need to be able to check on them or have somebody check on them. Yeah. So can I go away for a weekend if I have chickens? You can. Yep. If you have the right setup, you definitely can do that. But I was surprised at how social they are. And so, you know, plan to see them daily. <laughs> it's, and that's a good way to know if, if something's wrong too, because you'll get to know their personalities and their behavior and you'll be able to notice like, oh, this one's not acting right or there's a cut here or whatever. So, you know, plan to be with them daily. Yeah. Keep their coops clean. They do require cleaning 
at least weekly. I mean, it depends on how many you have. I only have three, so we we can get away with weekly. Michelle has a different system and she has more and she has more space too. So like when we let ours out, I have to be out with them. And so that's just our rules here. I don't, you don't have that rule, right? Out in the run or out free range? Free range. And talk to me more about the cleaning. So what does that look like once a week? What are you doing? Okay. In the book, you can see my setup. It's a little bit different than most people's. I have a poultry pen from Tractor Supply where my coop is inside. So the poultry pen is essentially my chicken run Mm -hmm. too. And then their little coop is where they go at night and where they lay their eggs. And so we take it out and scrape all their poop out and re Replenish all the pine shavings and stuff. But then in the summer, every month, I pull that whole coop out because I have a plastic Formex one and I scrub it down and spray it with the hose and let it sun dry. So that's what I mean. Michelle, what do you look like? Yeah. So we converted an old shed, like a tool shed, into a chicken coop because my husband's crafty like that. He's my handy hubby, I call him. <laughs> so he's, he's good like that. So we've got a wooden coop and then we have where they are roosting. So you also need to always have like a roosting bar or many roosting bars, depending on how many chickens you have, because chicken math, right? You come home, you're like, yeah, I need three chickens. Okay, six. And then you come home with nine. That's just how it goes. Like that's that's chicken math. So you on your roosting bar underneath that, we have something we call our poop plate. (laughs) So because they spend so much time when they're sleeping, chickens poop in their sleep. Fun fact. So if you're able to collect most of the poop from inside the coop on a plate, then we scrape it and just collect that and put that into the compost. So we're not having to change over the straw quite as much inside the coop. And ours are free ranging a lot more typically than... Because you have a backyard that's fenced so they can be within your... Yeah, we have a completely fenced in backyard. Okay. And more space. Yeah. And yeah, larger space. And because you girls are in the suburbs... Like, it's really scary to have chickens where I live. Everybody has them, but you're constantly hearing of wolves and like bears and large predators that come in and just take out whole flocks. And it's heartbreaking because you really, apparently, you you develop relationships with these chickens. For sure. You don't have that, right? No, we do. We do. Um, Okay. Not bears. Well, we have bears in White Bear Lake. Oh my gosh. But we have black bears that are around right now. But we... Three years ago, had our entire flock taken out by a fox. Oh, no. And that was heartbreaking. And then just, I'm trying to think now, five days ago, we had another fox come by and it got one of our hens. And I mean, it was licorice. It was one of our babies. Like, we've loved this chicken forever. And so, and like, I ran at this fox. Luckily, my indoor you know, like little mutt puppy was like freaking out. So I could tell something was going on. I ran to the backyard and I, the fox dropped the other chicken that was in its mouth and left. So the chicken was in shock. She is doing better. She's laid two eggs now. So like she's back. Wow. Since getting attacked. Wow. Yeah. So she's back. She's doing fine. But this is like reality. So I think like we set this up right away in the book too, is that it's like, it's different than being like, and I know your your listeners will understand this. It's a different level than being a plant mama, right? Being a plant parent, it's different with your, what are they? Is it a midgy, a bidgy? What I can't, a budgie? A budgie, my parakeet. <laughs> I can't even remember the name, sorry. Mm-hmm. It's just a different level of like life but that you're taking care of yeah. and that you're responsible yeah. for. So, but if you set things up, right, right. You've got a, like a nice run for them. There's lots of ways to keep them really safe. So this was a really random attack. It was like during the middle of the day, like it wasn't completely unexpected, but now my chickens are on lockdown, right. For the next couple of weeks while we figure out if this fox is coming back, it was just, you know, in cycles of nature, right. It was looking for food for its babies. I'm a hundred percent sure of that, right. Like it, it needed to survive too. And this is when like city life and country life kind of cross. Yeah. So it's part of raising chickens, but I also know that that chicken had a really good life living in my backyard compared to somewhere in a factory. And we had a a lot of really good eggs from her and she had, you know, a sad ending, but it was also something that my children loved her. They got to know her. They got to know where some of their food came from that way. 
So there's pluses and minuses for all of it. And it's part of life. And I think it's worth it for us. Yeah. Going through that emotional piece is really worth it for all the other benefits. You also mentioned in your book talking about how when you get chickens, you should really have an end of life plan for them as well, because they only lay eggs for so long. And then you have to decide, do you want to keep them in your flock? Do you need to give them away to someone who fosters elder hens? Like, I do almost feel like chickens, it's like you have houseplants, you know, in your garden. Then you have chickens who seem, yes, you develop a relationship with them, but they do seem more fleeting than like a dog that's going to be with your family for like 15 years. And you would never think about giving your dog away when it's older. But if you have chickens for eggs, like it is kind of a different, it's in its own different category of caretakingness, <laughs> caretakership. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, and they live outside too. So you're not as bonded. They're not like cuddling with you on your couch. Yeah, you're not as blended. But yeah, it is still very sad. But yeah, definitely because people think, oh, we're going to get chicks. It's going to be so fun. Oh, we're going to have all these eggs. But oftentimes, yeah, don't realize that they don't lay forever. And do you want chicken pets now? What are you going to do after that? Yeah, I know. That's why I just wish I could pay tractor supply company because, you know, I sound like a psycho right now, but I've gone to multiple garden centers in the time where they're selling the chicks because all I want to do is hold a chick and like just cuddle with it. And none of them will let me hold them. And I'm like, I wish there was a service. I would pay someone $10 or $20 to just be able to go and like hold their chick for an hour just because I want that experience. But I don't know if I know I'm not ready for a full to be a full time chicken mom. I just love chicks. They're magical. Yeah, they're pretty cute. Yeah, yeah. And now I've just exposed myself to my audience of being like a totally insane person. (laughs) But they already knew that. They already knew that. I've done crazy stuff with my houseplants too. Okay, I love this. This has been so interesting. So to wrap up, do you each have a memory in your homesteading journey that you feel like might be inspirational for someone who's on the fence about whether or not they might take the sleep? putting us on the spot here. But when you said that, the first thing I thought of is in 2020, when I I started all, well, before our tree came down and we expanded our garden, I had started a bunch of tomatoes in the house and I was used to starting seeds, but I would give them away. And so since this tree came down and we had this brand new, big, sunny space, I was able to keep a lot more. I mean, I must've had like 20 tomato plants that year and they all did really, really well. I mean, I had tomatoes coming out of my ears and I was giving them away to the neighbors and to the family and freezing them in gallon bags to preserve later. And then I made tons of Bloody Mary mix and ketchup and pizza sauce. And I did some salsa. And then I had all these green tomatoes. So I made spicy green tomato pickles and green tomato salsa and fermented green tomato salsa and all all this stuff. And that was just like a freak accident, but I loved it. That was like my favorite growing season. So I guess that was my favorite experience. I don't remember the question. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. It's it's honestly very full circle listening to Michelle's green bean story that part of the delight of this homesteading adventure, this gardening adventure is the stuff that you don't plan for and then what you learn on the other side of it, right? You probably learned a new recipe. You probably were able to make a connection with someone that you weren't connecting with because you were gifting them tomatoes or gifting them some of your, you know, fermented green tomato salsa. (laughs) So I love that. What about you, Michelle? I was trying to think about this. They're very, there's two that like are pulling from me is, are coming to mind. Hit us with both. You can share both. (laughs) Okay. One is just like that moment when you're in the garden all by yourself And you're surrounded Mm -hmm. by like the buzzing of the bees and you can smell like the tomato smell is coming at you because they're so warm. Right. And you can just and just like breathing in that moment and feeling the sun and the birds and like, you know, just everything like that is a moment where I'm like in this like little wonderland, but I got to help it grow and it's going to sustain me. And like there's like this. ah, It's just amazing. Yeah. So there's that kind of feeling. Yeah. And then the opposite, I kind of think, is like when my kids are running around crazy and like helping me harvest and doing it as quick as they can because they want to go play football or whatever, right? Because they're onto something that, but it's that chaotic, almost like joyous, we're all in this together moment. So 
there's like the two pieces of that where I get to be by myself in like peaceful nature and then like the going crazy with the family helping out and like they're eating things like off the vine while they're back. You know, it's just, yeah, both of those. What a gorgeous gift for your kids. Oh my God. I just think about like when your kids are in their twenties and they're asked what their childhood's like, and they're like, yeah, I grew up eating tomatoes off the vine, chasing chickens. It's amazing. They don't know anything else. Right. I hope they apply it, you know, because they're learning so much and they do help both of our, you know, she has two boys. I have one girl. They all are involved in help. So they are learning. But I had this cute experience a couple of days ago. We have an herb garden right outside of our front door and I had the windows open and my daughter loves onion chives, just pulling them and chewing on them like a blade of grass. And the neighborhood kids were around and she goes, this other little girl, she's five. She goes, what are you eating? And she said chives. And so then she brought her over and she must have given her some because then like a couple minutes later, I heard the little girl go, I love chives. And I just thought it was the cutest thing, you know, getting the little kids involved and interested and, you know. Start them young. Start them young. You know, it's interesting. I obviously interview so many people and I always ask like, how did you become the plant parent you are today? And so many of them, well, it's interesting. They were either plant blind their whole life and they came to plants late or they grew up with parents that gardened and took it for granted, left home, went to college, felt something was missing and then refound their passion for plants on their own because it was so intrinsic to their childhood. So I see that for your kids because like, you know, I hear that a lot from people of, yeah, I grew up with this amazing garden, but I totally took it for granted. I didn't understand that that's not how everybody grew up. And then they only came to like really appreciate it, you know, in their 20s and 30s when they had to recreate it for themselves. So you ladies are amazing. This book is so good. Like I said, it's a beautiful community feel. I love that you're highlighting other creators. I love that you're both sharing your own experiences. I'm definitely going to be referring to it. We didn't even get to talk about maple syrup, but you have a whole chapter on tapping your own maple trees and making your own maple syrup. So if you're curious, get the book. It's called Small Scale Homesteading. And where can we all find you and go follow you? You can find our book anywhere that books are sold online worldwide. Otherwise, locally, like Michelle said, tractor supply companies, we just don't have a list of where it is like in brick and mortar stores. Yeah. And then I'm Stephanie, uh, Minnesota from scratch, mostly active on Instagram. I do have a website, but it's under construction, but that's minnesotafromscratch.com. Amazing. Yeah. And then I'm Michelle at Forks in the Dirt on Instagram. I have a website and then a mostly locally um, focused Facebook page. Beautiful. Well, let's stay in touch, ladies. This was so fun. And I'll report back on my first water bath adventures. Yay. Thanks for having us. Exciting. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you so much, Michelle and Stephanie. These ladies are so nice. I love talking to them. I'm so inspired by their homesteads. Just again, so Michelle is Forks in the Dirt and Stephanie is Minnesota from scratch. So they have blogs, they have social channels. You should go follow them. We're going to put everything in the show notes of this episode so you can click to go follow them. And also their book is called Small Scale Homesteading, A Sustainable Guide to Gardening, Keeping Chickens, Maple Sugaring, Preserving the Harvest, and more. It's so good. It's so informative. Like I said in the interview, it's the only book Billy has actually read before I did. We get sent so many books and the minute it came, Billy was like, oh yeah, I'm stealing this book from you. And yeah, once again, just like the most gorgeous story of plant friendship that's so inspiring. These ladies are powerhouses. So go check them out. Thank you again to our sponsors for supporting the show. And most importantly, thank you to this community. Thank you for listening. Thank you for continuing to show up. If this episode resonated with you, go send it to a friend. If you have a friend who you think is interested in homesteading, send this episode to them. Leave a five-star review if you haven't already on your preferred podcast player. And if you are looking for plant friends of your own, come join us in the Garden Society. You just have to go to jointhegardensociety.com. You'll click the community plan. Like I said, it's the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. And the entire app app is searchable. So say you want to grow Cosmos this year and you want to learn more about Cosmos growing, you just type Cosmos into the search bar and every post ever about Cosmos over the two to three years of the app being in existence will show up. So it's like this living library basically of plant care. 
And that's what we mean by propagate your plant knowledge. We really want people sharing their own plant knowledge and experience with each other. Okay, I've talked a lot. So thank you so much. I hope you all take one step towards becoming little homesteaders. We're certainly going to be preserving our food. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Grow and Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast.